Well, question number five is a very straightforward question from thermodynamics. Straightforward in this regard because if anyone has come to the level of JE advance, then this should not be a difficulty. The graph is of a VT diagram. And let me even show one thing. It's one mole of a monoatomic ideal gas. These are the key parameters. Now, if you see, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. 4, 1 and 2, 3 are isochoric because the volume is constant. And 1, 2 and 3, 4, if you notice at 1, 2, V is directly proportional to T because when temperature is doubled, the volume is doubled. Likewise, even for 3, 4, when temperature is halved, the volume is halved. So 1, 2 and 3, 4, both are the processes where V is directly proportional to T. And if V is directly proportional to T, it means the pressure has to be constant. So effectively, 1, 2 is isobaric, 2, 3 isochoric, 3, 4 isobaric, and 4, 1 isochoric. Therefore, option number 1 would be incorrect. Now, let's go for the next one. The ratio of heat transfer during process 1, 2, and 3, 4. Now we need to calculate the ratio of heat transfer. If I say 1, 2, and 3, 4, both are isobaric process. And the expression would be NCP delta T. I need to find the ratio. So all I need to do is that calculate the ratio of change in temperature, 1, 2. That's T naught. And change in temperature is T naught by 2. So the ratio of heat has to be 2 is to 1 while the option is 1 is to 2, so B would be incorrect. Likewise, now let's go for the next one. The ratio of heat transfer, we need to find the ratio of heat transfer 1, 2 is to 2, 3. So effectively, we need to find the ratio of heat between this process and this process. All right, so let's see. What will I get? Q12 is going to be, because it's, isobaric NCP delta T and that's T naught and 2, 3 is isochoric so that's NCV again if you find the change in temperature that's minus T naught but we need it to calculate the ratio of heat transfer in terms of magnitude so that negative sign will not at all matter alright now let's see all I need to do is that find the ratio of Cp is to Cv, and since it's monoatomic, Cp is to Cv is going to be 5 is to 3. So this option, option number C, would be correct. And eventually, we need to calculate the work done in this thermodynamic cycle, the net work done, complete. Well, the complete work done can be calculated in this way, because the work done in this and this would be 0, they are isochoric. And if I have to calculate the work done here, see that's nR delta T, because for isobaric, that's nR delta T. And that will be T naught. And this one, that's going to be nR delta T. So that will be minus of nR T naught by 2. Henceforth, the total work done would be nR T naught by 2. Number of mole being 1, the option RT0 by 2 is correct. So the correct option for this question would be option number C and D. Quite a straightforward one, right? Let's now move to the next. Okay, question number 6, which is from the experimental part, which is one of the regular feature of JE Advance. It says that two identical moving coil galvanometers have 10 ohm resistance and full scale deflection at 2 micro ampere. Okay, so it says that 10 ohm and 2 micro ampere. Okay, 10 ohm is the resistance of the galvanometer and maximum current that's 2 micro ampere that has been given. Now it says, let's see what it says. One of them is converted into a voltmeter of 100 millivolt full scale. So let's see, when it's converted into 100 millivolt, so 100 millivolt 
will be equals to IG multiplied by RG plus of the resistance, high resistance, which is connected in series. Now, I've just calculated it beforehand. So the value of R upon calculation comes as 4,999 ohm. Just to save the time, the value has been pre-calculated. After that, it says the second device, and the second one has been converted into amp meter of 1 milliampere full scale current. So let's see. In the same manner, see, 1 milliampere is here. This is the galvanometer resistance. This is the shunt here. Then here comes the new range. And here comes IG. And when you calculate this, I minus IG into RG equals to IG multiplied by S, you compute it and you get the value of shunt comes out to be 0 0.02 ohm. Be rest assured that has been pre-calculated. So we calculated the resistance to be added in series for voltmeter and resistance to be added in parallel to convert it into amp meter. Now it says this voltmeter and amp meter is used to verify Ohm's law and there is an ideal cell and the resistance is 1000 ohm. Okay. Now this is what we need to do. Means the actual value of resistance is 1000 ohm and to verify Ohm's law we connect a voltmeter across it, we connect an amp meter in series and let's see what sort of figure is going to happen. The figure typically would be something like this. This is the resistance of 1000 ohm and the Ohm's law is validated by taking this as the specimen one and there's an amp meter, right? And likewise, there would also be a voltmeter. Now there's a voltmeter, amp meter and yes, of course, there is a potential difference. So let me call that the potential difference is E. Now what you need to do is that you need to compute the reading of voltmeter. That's very easy. This and this parallel and this series, you know, the net resistance of this and this. A bit of calculation is there but can't help out. So you compute the value of voltmeter, you compute the value of amp meter and that V upon amp meter, the reading of voltmeter is to reading of amp meter will give us the resistance and when you calculate the resistance comes very close to 980 ohm. So option number A would be correct. Now the second option I need to verify is the resistance of the amp meter will be 0.02 ohm and when you compute it you can easily calculate by rounding off to second decimal place so even option number B would be correct. And in the same manner you calculate option number C, option number D, they will not be having the correct match. So option number A and option number B would be the correct option for question number 6. Alright, now let's move to the next one. Okay, the seventh question is quite interesting. It has been brought from ray optics and specifically much to play with the lens maker formula. But every option of this question demands a serious thought, so can't be taken for granted. It says something like this, a thin convex lens is there made of two materials, refractive indices N1 and N2. The radius of curvature of both the sides are equal, that has been given. Now F is the focal length of the lens when both the refractive indices were equal, then the focal length is F. And it says the focal length is F plus delta F when N1 is N, that means this hasn't been changed and N2 has been moved to N plus delta N. Together these conditions are given which will help us to find some mathematical conclusion. So the conclusion is when both the refractive indices were equal, focal length was F and when one is kept N and other is increased, the focal length has also increased and that change in focal length we can call it as delta F. This is what we had to find. 
Now, let's see. On the basis of this, we need to come with the conclusion whether delta f by f is greater than, less than delta n by n in that way. Okay, as I say that, it requires a very serious thought. Let's go step by step. The first thing is, see, I can write 1 by f is n1 minus 1 by r plus n2 minus 1 divided by r. Now, taking in this way that the focal length is calculated when n1 and n2 is kept different, okay? Then what you can do is that, say, if you go for a derivative minus df by f square, that can be written as something like this. This part will remain constant, and this part you can write it as d n2 divided by r. Now the first thing what I can understand here is, if I see the third option, it says delta n by n is negative when delta f by f is positive. That means with increase in the refractive index, it says that the focal length is decreasing because one is negative, other is positive, and that exactly satisfies the condition. So here we can say option number C is the correct one. Now let's go with the next part. The relation between delta F by F and delta N by N remains unchanged if both the convex surfaces are replaced by concave surfaces of the same radius of curvature, and that goes exactly the same. Because all the difference is that the individual radius would be changed in sign, rest everything would be same. Therefore, option number B will come out to be the correct one. How about option number E? Let's see. In order to come to the conclusion of option number E, what I can do is see, I can write something like this. 1 by F is 2N minus 1 upon R. When that's a situation when individual refractive indices are same. Now you just divide this divided by this and you just compute for the given value of n between 1 to 2, this option will come out to be incorrect. So option number E would not be chosen. That's a very simple calculation. And eventually when it comes here, look it says for n equals to 1.5 and delta n has also been given and f has also been given, the value of delta f will be so this can also easily be computed in this given calculation. And when you compute the value, option number D will come out to be correct. So for question number seven, option number B, C, and D are the correct option. That was a bit thought provoking. Now let's go for the next one. The next question, that is from units and dimension, quite an expected feature as regard to JE Advance. And you could see here, it says that in a new system of unit, mass and angular momentum are dimensionless, and the length has dimension L. Based on this parameter, we need to find the dimension of force, power, and so on. The first thing is C. It says that mass is dimensionless. Even the angular momentum, which would be ml square t minus 1, that is dimensionless. Now here, m has already been dimensionless. And for this thing to be dimensionless, quite obviously, l square has to be equals to t. That's the condition. Now based on this, we can find the dimension of force and other thing, whatever has been asked, let's see. For the force is ml t minus 2. And you know, this is already dimensionless. Now, see t is l square. So t is l square. Effectively, that will be l minus 3. So option number A would be correct. Let's go for power. Power is ml square t minus 3. This is already dimensionless. Now, see this is going to be L raised to the power minus 6 into 2, L raised to the power minus 4, while option is L raised to the power minus 5, so this would be incorrect. In the same manner, you can compute 
dimension of linear momentum mlt minus 1 and this m is dimensionless now let's see this is going to be l raised to the power minus 2 effectively l raised to the power minus 1 that's correct likewise you can verify the dimension of energy that would be l minus 2 that was a straightforward but yes a wonderful twist was there let's go to the next